All right, and I think we're good to go. So I'm speaking today with Diane Singerman and Kareem Ibrahim, the co-founders and directors of Tadamun, the Cairo Urban Solidarity Initiative. Uh, Kareem is a founder of Taqween Integrated Community Development in Cairo, uh, and Diane um, is an associate professor in government at the School of Public Affairs at American University. Um, so launched in 2010, Tudaman conducts and promotes research on urban planning, local development, urban governance and inequality in Cairo and other Middle East and North African cities. Um, and Tudaman has published over 150 policy briefs in English and Arabic, including the report that we'll discuss today, uh, Planning and Justice, which was first released in English in 2018 uh, and is now available in print in both English and Arabic uh, at Tadween Publishing. So thanks to you both so much for joining me today. Thank you, Jonas. Thanks. So to start, um, could you give us uh, you know, a brief introduction to Tadaman in general uh, and the Planning and Justice Report in particular? Diane, I guess I'll start with you. Uh, sure. Um, Tadaman was begun uh, with Kareem and I um, in 2010 before the revolution to um, think about urban planning and urban issues in Cairo a bit differently. Um, we wanted to learn more about the city, but also to ask the residents of the city to build local knowledge about the city. Um, we were very interested in the local scale, the municipal level and the ways in which that um, intersected with planning issues and, 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 and other issues. Um, and it was also a, a question of, of um, sort of the, the dominant path of urban planning in Egypt or the historical path. Um, and um, the sense that there might be a, a, a better way to do this um, that uh, would also engage the, the needs the differentiated needs of, of residents. Um, there was a, a real um, interest in informal areas, but the ways in which people viewed informal areas between planned and unplanned or safe and unsafe, um, we've, we thought there were, there, this needed more articulation, more research. Um, and we were also very interested in, in, in trying to publish re evidence-based research about the city that was also accessible to residents of the city, not just to academics. Um, yeah, and maybe Kareem can add to that. Yeah, I think you're putting it together well. <clears throat> I think the Daman was, uh, um, as Diane mentioned, like it began before like um, 2011, but it came at a very timely moment for us, like uh, luckily is that it enabled us, besides what Diane mentioned is to you, document a very, uh, I think, um, uh, rare and important moment in urban mobilization in, in cities and even in rural areas in Egypt between 2011 up to like 2015, 2016. And um, the accumulation of like the um, interviews, the data we collected during this period of time, I think it's big, like with time, it proves to be very valuable to document a moment of flex, like uh, of like uh, influx of like different movements, like relationships between the state and like the different like um, uh, non-governmental actors, residents and neighborhoods and stuff like that. And and it basically, I think it's like the more uh, even on a personal level when I um, trying to do some research on this era or like try to write something about urban mobilization in Egypt, um, Tadamun comes up like to us like as like one of the major resources that documented this very rich moment of mobilization. So that, that's why it's like to me, <clears throat> it proved even more valuable with time because it's like you can see like the amount of knowledge that has been generated put together on this resource even and to understanding the different levels of government in Egypt and like the relationship between the different institutions, it became like a, as a resource for different researchers and people working in the field. I'd, I'd, also, I'd also say that one of the interesting things and, and sometimes complicated things, it was an interdisciplinary effort. We had, we had a, a, a wonderful people. It was a very collaborative process, but Kareem is an architect, I'm a political scientist, we had economists, we had uh, sort of GIS experts. It was, 
It was trying to bring an interdisciplinary um, kind of uh, exchange um, because again, there's a lot of, there had been a lot of important work by mm -hmm. housing rights activists, by um, historic preservationists, by, by architects and planners, but we were kind of interested in, in, in interrogating these things and in, in, in sort of bringing uh, politics, local politics and architecture. And, and, and as the revolution ensued, I would say we were following um, uh, interest and demands for social justice in the built environment, putting those things together, putting housing mm -hmm. together with uh, public service provision uh, or the right to adequate housing. Um, and as Kareem said, um, working with other activists to also uh, present a lot of these issues to the Egyptian public to the extent that there were, there were some really important uh, progress in the Egyptian constitution in 2014, which did recognize the right to adequate housing and, and made it illegal for forced evictions and things like that. So, so writing about these issues, uh, putting attention at particular neighborhoods and, and, and also writing about some of the positive, um, you know, really important projects that had gone on. Kareem worked for many, many years on the Al Azhar uh, Trust for Culture and building of the Azhar Park. But the question is why does some of those, why do some of those great efforts of building public spaces, why does it need donor money or why does it need foreign expertise? Why aren't, why aren't these kinds of uh, initiatives just normal? And, and, and that's what I think we were working for, making, making smart renovation, working with local residents, not against them or not ignoring them, but, 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 but going to them for their understanding and expertise of, of, of how to solve some problems. And sort of on that note, I mean, so could you talk a little bit more about how the, you know, the, the planning and justice report in particular sort of came about? Um, and now, you know, with, with uh, its translation and, and availability um, in Arabic with its release now, um, you know, uh, who do you hope might engage with the findings in the report uh, uh, now that it's available in Arabic? Uh, <clears throat> I can like, discuss it from my viewpoint and also then I think she can also add to this <clears throat> the idea about planning justice it came up like at least to us in the <clears throat> around 2012 2013 from two um, like questions from two backgrounds one of them was theoretical um, is that the debate about formal informal legal illegal of like and and how like urban areas are being classified in this very formalistic a top-down point of view. It's, it's basically how the state or how the decision maker sees a neighborhood from a legalistic point of view or even a formalistic point of view of like being formal looks ugly, like the, even the uh, urban fabric, it doesn't look like um, uh, in, in proper shape or so on and so forth. And, and this was like a, a very important debate that was taken. I think it's still right now is taking place about like calling or even stigmatizing like some neighborhoods as uh, informal or Ashwaiya. Um, the second question came from a, like a very pragmatic point of view. At, at the point at the Queen, we were consultants for like bilateral organizations like the um, um, French Development Agency or others. And what, there was an interest both from the state and from the many donor agencies to work in existing urban areas and to upgrade them. And this is where we uh, have our expertise. And um, basically you find yourself in a question where you have like millions of euros coming to, or US dollars coming to a city like Cairo and asking, okay, what are your priorities? What are like the areas that most needy that we need to work on? And um, it was like an eye-opening experience for us. We knew it, but we had to see it like in action that nobody had an answer. Uh, so there was like this kind of like model, like um, informal areas like uh, Manchet Nasa, for example, which comes to mind to anybody like in Cairo when you ask them about an informal area. But who said that Manchet Nasser is the most needy? Is there were like the um, living conditions are the worst in Cairo? This we don't know. We don't know as urbanists even we don't know the answer. So. Um, 
we said, yes, okay, let's get out of this dilemma and think of something that's evidence-based that works on the local level to understand where the needs are and what these needs are actually. So um, in, in terms of like what we found is that you cannot call like urban areas as unsafe or unplanned and full stop. That doesn't mean anything because it's like if you say unplanned then the other action would be to plan them but to plan them towards what direction or for towards what need. So we wanted to start this like evidence-based approach to develop a, a tool that can identify where the needs are and provide a decision-making mechanism that is dynamic, that is actually can show like where the needs are in a very like dynamic way, not just static. You cannot call like Anshit Nasser as an informal area for the past 25 years without recognizing all the efforts done by the state or by non-state actors within this neighborhood. Um, it changed the like living conditions in the neighborhood, like all these efforts. So you cannot just like ignore them and say like, it's still like we need more and more and more there. So we wanted to build this tool that achieves like goes from this um, um, dilemma of like formal and informal to look into several aspects. One of them is to move from like the rural urban like inequality um, comparison, which is clear and everybody knows about it to Intra urban inequalities analysis, what happens within the city itself on the Shia Khanav, which takes us to the local level within the city itself. We don't see like the particularities of like the different neighborhoods, the different Shiahas, or even the small administrative units within the city. The second is to like move from income disparities, which is again an important to multidimensional inequality. So this is also another move that we wanted to um, uh, test through this like uh, tool. And um, as I said, like moving from the static classification of like neighborhoods to more of a dynamic mapping of needs. Needs change from a neighborhood to another from a year to year. When the government builds a school in a neighborhood, that means like at least the provision of a service is improved, not, not to mention the quality itself. We don't know anything about the quality of the service, but at least there is an evidence that there is something presented. Maybe another neighborhood needs the same next year. And, and finally, we needed a lens and, and this lens for us to see like a neighborhood, whether it's adequate for like people to live in it or not, was the right to adequate housing. Because it's not only about the housing, but it's also about the livability of a certain neighborhood. If we can break down the elements of like this livability into what constitutes a global right, like the right to adequate housing, which has been recognized as Dan said, by the Egyptian constitution into elements like, <clears throat> um, uh, structural stability of the buildings, <clears throat> access to services, access to jobs, um, um, like adequacy of the buildings, uh, cultural adequacy, uh, affordability, or even like um, <clears throat> secure tenure. These are elements that we found um, um, evidence-based traces within the public census to measure them. So through the public census, you can know if people have access to water or not, or sanitation or not, or like they have like, let's say even the level of security of tenure within certain neighborhoods, you can identify this. So we use this tool to map like a city like Cairo and to understand these needs, which became to us like very, for us, it was like um, a very exciting experience because I'm from Cairo, but it was for the first time to me to see the city in such a way that is revealing a lot of its need that are hidden between the different figures and numbers within the census. So th that's why it's like, I see it's, it's important for us. It's not only as urbanists, but as decision makers, as residents within the neighbors to plan right. E Egypt is not like a rich country. We're like um, fight for like our resources in terms of water, in terms of access to like uh, finance and so on and so forth. And you need a prudent like tool to take decisions and to direct like these scarce resources to where they are really needed within uh, our cities and even within our governments. And so I think it's like, it's a tool that is beneficial for like multi purposes, not only a single purpose. And can I just also add that one of the really surprising things as, as, as we all know, Cairo and Egypt is one of the most studied countries in the Middle East um, and, and also has uh, amazing studies of poverty um, uh, the work of Sarah Sabri, Ragi Assad, others, right? But, but, but never has the analysis of poverty be, do, be do, done, never has it been done at the Shiacha level, at the neighborhood and district level. And so what we did, which took the, um, the knowledge of, 
of architects, a spatial knowledge, is we met, we literally broke up these, these issues. And there are different indicators that tell you different things at the neighborhood and the district level. And so, for example, as, as Karim was saying, there's something about um, telling us about density of, of poverty. Um, which neighborhoods are most densely populated with poor people, right? But other, uh, but there's also, you know, which neighborhoods, how many people live under the poverty line, which is a different measure, right? Um, and, and so understanding these different measures at the neighborhood level also gives us a sense of people's perceptions of inequality, right? Because uh, academics and researchers tell us that Egypt had a very fairly low inequ um, very, fairly low inequality. The Gini coefficient is 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 0.3. Um, so, but but nevertheless, there was a revolution, right? So the kind of macro indicators, how do they fit with residents' points of view? And so what we were able to do was to look at the city as a whole. And as Kareem said, understand different, um, different characteristics of neighborhoods and therefore different needs. Um, but the other thing that we were able to do, again, adding housing and the quality of housing and secure tenure, um, economic variables, so a multi-dimensional look at poverty, not just income, which is, which is what usually is measured. But I think the other thing that we did that we tried that we was was mapping and and that's part you know Tadaman has always produced all of our material all of our materials in English and Arabic sometimes Arabic first sometimes English first we've spent a lot on translating absolutely everything but the but the big commitment that we had was to try to represent this this difficult complicated story visually and that's why mapping was so important and that's why um, you know, our, 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 our staff that could do GIS, and it, it wasn't an easy, it is not at all an easy yeah. <laughs> proposition because administrative boundaries change. Um, you know, we use some, some, some aerial maps and, and a whole range of things, but a, 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 a lot of this material we could find, and a lot of it was public, but we spent a lot of resources and, and our staff time and our staff expertise in putting this together. But we were committed always to Dunlin, has always been committed to try to um, present this material in a way that people could understand. Um, not sure we, we always uh, have, have done that, but, but one of the things that we've done in the last couple of years, again, all of our materials are online. This report in English has been online for a long time. And now we're trying to sort of take this material and, 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 and make sure that it's kind of permanently available in print form. Um, so anyway, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, and I guess, you know, lastly, uh, maybe Kareem, if you could talk briefly um, uh, a little bit about uh, what changes you've seen uh, in the greater Cairo region, um, you know, uh, in the field of urban planning and development, um, you know, since, 2011 and, and maybe even since uh, the release of the English version of the report in 2018? Um, I think Cairo has been changing very rapidly. Like um, all the time, I don't like think it's like, Cairo is a very dynamic city. And uh, especially after like the, uh, the government plans to build a new administrative capital, there have been some criticism of like not paying attention to the existing urban areas. And um, the government like, uh, has been working since then on several projects inside existing urban areas in Cairo itself, like in historic Cairo, in Heliopolis, in informal areas, in Fustat, for example, which is like uh, um, in the southern parts of Cairo, to um, like upgrade like these existing areas. Sometimes it was successful, sometimes it was met with some critique from like the audience, but I think it's like, it's, it's a very dynamic like uh, um, city in terms of like the changes that take place on the physical level. So uh, uh, we have like dozens of bridges being built, areas have been removed entirely and being renovated. And, um, and, and, and basically that started like, I think, Again, um, 
kind of like a dialogue or a mobilization between like the public feedback on the projects that take place right now and the government, which I think is healthy. Like, um, uh, so very recently there have been a lot of like interventions in historic care that it's like many like experts didn't see that it's like the most appropriate way to intervene there. The government responded and actually it's like affirmed that it's like it can work according to the guidelines of international organizations like UNESCO and so on and so forth. And I think it's healthy to have this dialogue and like back and forth of like, um, it's not happening on the neighborhood level, it's happening more on a public realm of like discussions in social media uh, and even conventional media on TV and so on. So um, on another note, like the government also had other plans for, uh, uh, for example, like there is an ambitious rural development program that is, addresses the needs of almost 1,500 um, like villages that house almost more than 50 million inhabitants live in these targeted villages. And it happens all across Egypt. And we can see like, uh, I'm not talking about the product itself of like the program, but like the methodology it's been following that has been heavily relying on feedback coming from the Ministry of Planning, talking about fiscal planning, not uh, um, spatial planning, where like indicators similar to the ones we've been using and to that one have been actually are put into use. So we see now like um, a methodological approach that is being used by the Ministry of Planning to identify the needs in the villages, what type of interventions are required, what type of indicators of progress that can be measured, which I think it's like a very good move towards the, um, uh, the right direction. So basically what's happening in Cairo is that the government intervenes in, in many areas, sometimes without like proper consultation with the residents, residents like respond to that. And then there is a dialogue that starts, which I think this kind of engagement, um, it's a learning curve for everybody to like try to uh, find other ways that has been different from what happened after 2011. So you cannot do contestation for sure, but at least you can use other tools and, uh, uh, and, and techniques that can actually uh, create this kind of like, um, discussion about like public thing issues uh, about neighborhoods like very recently there has been um a debate about like a planned bridge in a very like um uh, a heritage sensitive part of like uh, heliopolis and um there has been mobilization among the residents and actually the government responded very positively and actually changed these plans so the like you can see the ways like social media like campaigns going to conventional media using parliament member elected parliament members to actually voice the needs of the residents i think all of these discussions need to bring back the need of like something like the domain to document what really happened as a debate and which i think it's 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 like a discussion that happens and takes place in different forms than what we used to have here. Uh, and I think it's like on long term that can have some kind of positive impact on urban policies, at least in existing in like neighborhoods like Cairo and, and other cities. The rural program, I think um, it would be worth uh, like monitoring to see like how these like tools are being put in, into effect how they are monitored and like in long term and what I would like to measure the impact of the intervention of the program itself. So uh, I think there are lots to take from like what's happening in Cairo and Egypt in general right now that relates to either like Tadamon or like the uh, specific like targets of like uh, a project like planning and justice. Can, can I also just add something about uh, the planning and justice? One of the things, the other dimensions that we really cared about was local governance, local government. Um, and as uh, we would mention, uh, there has not been local elections for local people's councils since 2008, before the revolution. Um, and But one of the things that we were able to do, for example, it's very important that a lot of the planning agencies and budgetary uh, preparation is supposed to be done in Egypt with input from the local level, whether it's schools, whether it's gas lines, whether it's just budgets in general. And so one of the things that Tadamon has always been interested in, uh, which very, which uh, is, is, lo is the local level, but also local governance and to, um, and, and to, to um, talk more about how that works institutionally, but also why it's very important for planning purposes for representation, for issues of deliberation, right? So people should be able to go to their local government when there are local issues. Um, and so that, that local scale 
We're also interested in that from an institutional point of view, from a municipal point of view. And, you know, again, not having local elected officials or even at the, the elected mayors, for example, um, makes Cairo a very different than many other, many other cities in the world. And, and not just Cairo, of course, but throughout the entire country. Um, right. Great, thank you. This has been a fantastic discussion. Um, thank you both so much uh, for joining me and, and we're so excited uh, that this report, uh, Planning and Justice is now uh, available through Tabbing Publishing, both in English and Arabic and, and to support you know, Tadamon's efforts in general. So thank, thanks again to both of you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, thanks very much. And, and we're very happy that um, Tadween Publishing, we're very, we're very thankful of, of, of your efforts to again, produce bilingual material that is also available online and through eBooks. Uh, that's, that's very important to what Tadaman has been doing all along. Sure. Fantastic.